Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. We've had a lot of guests on I Catch Killers who have stared evil in the face one way or the other. They have fought against evil in many ways. Some have taken it head on, whilst others prevented it before it happened. Today's guest has fought evil both ways. He's a military guy who has served in war zones, as an Australian soldier, and as a private contractor. He has seen and done things fortunately most of us don't experience. As a young man, today's guest joined the army because he wanted to strap on a gun and test himself. He found himself in war zones and facing down a two-way range. He has been shot and seen firsthand the devastation of war. He is also a student of history with an inquiring mind, and that found, that's why he found himself working in the intelligence corps of the Australian military. This is a fascinating area to work in, where he is responsible for selecting targets and predicting the actions of terrorist groups the military were fighting. His expertise and skills in this critical field were recognised. He has worked and lived in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, Jordan, Kurdistan, Saudi Arabia, Syria and the UAE. He assesses threats posed by terrorist organisations like the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. He has also been part of several domestic counter-terrorism operations, keeping us safe in our own country. My best description of today's guest is he is a former soldier who is a terrorism and counter-violent extremist expert. This is surely going to be a fascinating chat. So, Shane Healy, welcome to I Catch Killers. That was a uh, great intro. Uh, thanks for that, Gary. I'll uh, uh, pay you for it later. <laughs> you can get a copy of it, but uh, oh, you're hard, it's hard to describe because you have done so much. You've, you've seen uh, and you've looked at things from an operational point of view and then the intelligence aspect of it. It's, it's hard to encapsulate you in one thing because people could say hard-ass soldier and other people might say an academic. Well, yeah, and... Um, it's. I'm not a one out either. There's a lot of the guys that I worked with um, in Army Intelligence Corps that were the same background. You know, all came out of the infantry battalions, and but they just had that um, curious mind and um, wanted more out of themselves and their careers. Yeah, it's a good combination, isn't it, to have that physical? I, I think to have that physical side of soldiering, so you understand it from that point of view, but also then when you go into that Intel Corps. Where you're looking at things, a bigger picture, a broader picture, it, it helps to have that understanding from the ground up. Well, I think for me, um, because I'd been into Iraq in in combat and had lost mates uh, up close and personal, I took the my intelligence assessments really personal because I'd been on the end, and I know that uh, you know. And the story I tell was I'd been in uh, Afghanistan for about a week in 2010. I'm in a meeting with the boss, and next thing you know, they've rolled out on a target looking for rockets based on my assessment. And I've looked at my, my intelligence officer at the time and he goes, we play with live ammo here, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that sort of brings it home, doesn't it? Yeah, um, and, uh, and that was it. That was my, he's bang on. I'm not going to um, do half ass jobs and I'm not going to um, slide. I'm going to make sure I... And it made me a better analyst, a better soldier, but it, that's when I really also started looking at second and third order effects. Yeah. I think the, the fact that you've got that understanding of the consequences of something that you might say in a uh, briefing room that you understand at the sharp end where the people are kicking doors in or uh, you know, uh, um, got guns pointed, that you understand the importance of uh, the work that you're doing. Yeah, and especially in special operations, you're only as good as your last brief. Yeah. Like you could have uh, done 50 excellent briefs and they've got jackpots in the back of it. But if you, you know, one or two, and they sack you, send you yeah. home or, you know, you're out. So you can't have uh, bad days. You can't slide on, oh, I did this. Because that, that doesn't matter. That was yesterday. It's what are you doing for tomorrow? Yeah. It, it's interesting you say that because that's, that's pretty much policing at the uh, – at the um front end like locking people up and all that you could you could be locking up people for 20 years and then make a mistake and uh then that's what you're defined by so but it's good to have that pressure isn't it 100 percent, because it keeps that standard up if you if you were allowed to say well i can rest on my laurels here a little bit because i've done this this and that that's when you are going to make mistakes yeah and also um in special operations, and it doesn't matter what, you know, whether you're in the special air service or your intelligence or you're a signaler or even a mechanic, um, you're there to serve the mission first. And that's all that's important. And there's, you know, no rank and there's no BS. Yeah. It's essentially you're good at your job. If you're not, you're not here. And if you are, we're going to essentially keep you around 
Yeah. Yeah. Did it give the uh, guys and women on the ground uh, confidence knowing that you understood what they're going through? Did that uh, did that help? Um, yes and no, because there's that resting your laurels. So if I'd have been running around saying, oh, this is what I did. Yeah. See you, mate. Yeah. It's it's what can you do? What are you doing for oh, us? All right. So you you could be the toughest hard ass soldier on yeah. the in the battlefield, but uh, you need to perform in the intel room. And, and even even the shooters, you know, like yeah. if they uh, make a mistake or do something wrong out in a job, they're only one mistake uh, from going home themselves, and that happened a lot too. So there's you, you've really got to thrive on the pressure, which, which yeah. you know we, you watch all the. Um, Special Forces selection documentaries and movie. That's what they're looking for. How do you, can you remain calm in chaos? Can you think clearly? How's yeah. your decision making? Um, what do you take into consideration? Um, and, and you know whether you're at the tip of the spear kicking a Dorian or you're back doing the Bruce. That's what's important, and that's what they look for across the spectrum. Okay, um, I wanted to start off talking about, and I've I've heard you talk, and I've heard a lot of um, other people talk that are involved in the, in the military and and different things and uh, descriptions, and uh, uh, you would it be familiar with the uh, saying, uh, "Are you a, a sheepdog, sheep, or wolf?" Yeah, very much so. And uh, I take it we put you in the category of the sheep uh, dog. I would hope so. Okay. Do you want to break it down to explain what uh, people? Because if, if you listen to military guys talk long enough, you'll hear them say this quite often. So yeah, and it really blew up um, famous wise in the movie American Sniper, where Chris Kyle's it's about his life and his dad talks about it. So basically, um, a sheep is society. You know, ninety percent of people just want to go about their day to day. You know, work, support their family, love their family. Um, they're, they're not trying to hurt anyone and they don't want to be hurt. Then you've got the wolves, which is that 5% that prey on the sheep. You know, um, they want to rip the sheep off, they want to hurt the sheep, they want to harm, whatever. And then you've got the 5% um, that are sheep dogs. That's probably a bigger percentage now because I also include first responders into that. Yep. A- any role that you put yourself between the sheep and the wolf, you know, right. you're a sheep dog. So, uh, but basically, yeah, you know, you're willing to. Um, to, to even an SES guy who gets up at three in the morning in a storm goes on a roof. Yeah. You know they're doing the things that the sheep can't. But the the, the top spectrum is, um, and this is where the uh, I say the issues uh, arise. A lot of sheep can't tell the difference between a sheepdog and a wolf. Yeah, that's an interesting take uh, on it because you, the sheepdog and in the analogy in the writings. You've got to be the wolf. You've got to, um, you know, be on the fringes. You've got to be able to use violence. You've got to be able to get in first um, in order to stop the wolf targeting the sheep. But to a lot of the sheep who don't understand the differences, and because we all look the same, he's a wolf. He's trying to hurt me. Um, and and that's where a lot of uh, lines get blurred and... Um, there's a, a lot of confusion in society. Well, I suppose society could uh, look at uh, guys that, uh, as you described, looking after the flock, the, the sheepdog, but then uh, look at the, they just bundle them in with the wolf and go, yeah, they're just warmongers. Yep, it's, and uh, empathy is a big, big, the big difference between yeah. a wolf and a sheepdog. You know, a sheepdog, you, you've got to you feel with empathy because you're laying your life or you're putting yourself between the wolf and the sheep because you accept and uh, understand that that's not who the sheep are Um, and you've got to love the sheep and want to protect them to uh, stop the wolf, but not a lot of the sheep understand that. That's an underused word, empathy. I uh, the People often ask me, yeah, what makes a good uh, detective, a good police officer, and one of the main characteristics I say is empathy. And, 100%. Uh, it's funny that, uh, yeah, given your background and what you've seen and done, and you're throwing out the word empathy as well, but it, it, it separates it, doesn't it? It separates you from being the bad guy or the good guy. It's, yeah, uh, and, and I, um, you know, if you watch the movie Donnie Brasco, um, as just a quick example, and, you know, I've read, Joe Stone's book and Joe, keep, we had Joe on this podcast. Yeah, fascinating well, guy. When they keep asking him, why didn't you, when you attempted, you know, living the lifestyle of a mafia, and there was all the money and stuff, what stopped you crossing that line? Mm. Um, and, and that's, you know, empathy. And, and I knew that I was there, that they were the wolves, and I wasn't a wolf. Yeah, 
and he he that was his moral compass, and and that takes a lot of dedication and discipline. It, it's, it's a good way of describing it that uh, dedication and discipline, because I saw in the cops pre royal commission some people that uh, went the wrong way, and it was that moral compass. Yeah, they broke a rule, and then they got a little bit less and less, or yeah, a little bit less confronting doing what they've done, and then they've completely crossed the line. Yeah, I've had that conversation with a number of people over the years, and I call it well in the military it's called mission creep. But in in that context, it's it's almost uh, justification creep. Oh, it's only fifty bucks. Yeah, you know. Oh, it's only this. Or and you start, you know, inch by inch, justifying it because it's an inch by inch. But then after a year, it's a mile. Yeah. And that, um, you know, I I have met a lot of undercover police or like you, Reed, yeah. um, Donnie Brasco, and that. And you think. How could you do that for seven, eight years? Not see your family, have this ultimate persona, and you know. But that is a, a great example of the difference between the sheepdog and the wolf. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. Uh, I, I'm glad we put that out front so we know what, who we're dealing with. It's massive some of, in America. Some of the stuff we'll be talking about, you'd be call, calling you a wolf. You're hunting, but, uh, but but that's it. You are as a sheepdog. You are. Yeah. You, you are. You actually. You know, the best form of defense is offense. Yeah. You know, you need to get out and get the wolf because by the time he's in the in amongst the flock, it's too late. Yeah, well, I, a lot that comes out, like with um, whether it's policing or military, sometimes you've got to match violence with violence and people misunderstand who are these people that are supposedly the good guys that can, yeah. You know, well, I would say overmatch, you know. Um, one of the um, – and I um, know, especially know of him, my, my dad knew him uh, and I knew some of his relatives, but Bumper Farrell. Yeah. Talk about matching violence with violence. Yeah, you know he, his books are an amazing read because not only was he matching violence with violence, the crims were scared of him. Yeah, and that kept law and order. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't think it's match it. I think you've got to do it more. And they and we did that um, in special operations in Afghanistan. Mm. You know, when I first got there, we wore different uniforms to the conventional soldiers. We had beards, and yep. the Taliban go. They called us the bearded devils. Yeah. You know, don't if it's quite a loss around, they wouldn't even think about it because the violence of action that we bring to bear is times fifty compared to what they were used to. Yeah, I I do under, understand it. Why did you uh, join the army? What drew, did you grow up with? Always the uh, yeah. fantasy of running around with guns in the backyard. Yeah, then? yeah. Since as long as I can remember, um, both of my grandfathers served in World War Two. Uh, my mum's father was only sixteen at Kokoda. Oh, right. And okay. I was born on his birthday and uh, grew up on a farm in um, western New South Wales with him. Um, you know, he was one of my elders as a kid. And so, yeah, I always, you know, had a, my toy rifle and army clothes. And uh, one of my uncles was in the special air service. And, uh, yeah, I've got a massive military history uh, fam uh, background. Uh, there's a book um, called Footprints in the Sand of Time about – Indigenous soldiers uh, from around Coonabarabran Barabran and that. There's four pages yeah. in that book just dedicated to my family. All right. So you come from Indigenous family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. mum's side, yeah. So it was just, I don't remember a time when I didn't want to be a soldier. Okay. So it was uh, destined. Yeah. When you joined the army, did it uh, tick the boxes for you? Yeah, 100%. I'd already been an army cadet and yeah. I'd won cadet of the year and met the Duke of Ember. And um, yeah, it was. Um, it just recruit, recruit school was the best. Every day of recruit school was the best day of my life. And it was, and I wound up having to do army recruit school twice and did Navy recruit school. And uh, that recruit school in 05 was still Vietnam doctrine. A lot of Vietnam vets were in the senior positions. Yeah. Yeah. It was still in in 20 years or whatever, it's still one of the best times I had in the military. Yeah. And you know when you, your career, when you've hit the right uh, right mark of your career, I felt that when I joined the cops. And I, I hadn't grown up wanting to join the cops, but the moment I was in the cops, I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. This, yeah. is, this is me. So you obviously had that uh, that had that feeling. Yeah. So what your first couple of years in the Army, where where did you go? What, uh, what, how old were you and what 19, day? 1995. Okay. Um, I literally just played rugby. Yep. There wasn't much going on and I was already had already played a lot of rep rugby league and rugby union prior to joining and my dad had played first grade and um, it, in my recruit platoon, one of the section commanders, uh, we went to the same high school. Another section commander was the army rugby uh, captain and our platoon sergeant was the coach 
And I remember being in a, um, back then you join the army without a job. So like now, if you want to join the army, you get on defense website. Yep. Oh yeah, I want to do this. And you do that. Well, that didn't happen back then. You just got to Kapuka. You could end up anywhere. Yep. Yeah. And it did. There was a platoon, I think about two in front of me where nine of them become cooks. Yeah, and I'm like, no, no nothing, uh, nothing you can no, do about it. No criticism of cooks, but it's not what you if you join the army yeah. and you ended up in a kitchen. And so you would have to do minimum time in that role, and yeah. if you kick cans, you got bad report cards, so you couldn't end up dig in, um, and then transfer to whatever else you wanted to do. But you had to do minimum time. Yeah. But the emphasis back there was on being a good soldier, drill, dress, and bearing, and you know it doesn't matter what. Um, what job you are, you're a soldier first. Always maintain your fitness, maintain your weapon skills. And Whereas when I went back in 09 and people were joining the direct entry jobs, the emphasis wasn't so much on core military skills. Um, but I was lucky that, yeah, so I, I, um, I was in a, a psych uh, meeting about week two when you still have what's going on here. And the sergeant come up and goes, oh, I need to speak to Recruit Healy. And I'm like, oh, shit, what have I done? And he goes, I hear you play rugby. And I went, oh, yep. Yeah. And he goes, oh, would you be interested in playing for the Army? And I was like, oh, yeah. Come down to the Oval in the afternoon. So, yeah, then I went to Infantry Corps, went to the School of Infantry, but then and stayed there playing rugby. Yeah, so that was your, uh, yeah. your first first couple of years. Because back then, uh, 95, it, it's um, predated uh, 2001 when uh, everything blew up. The Army wasn't being utilised in combat zones a no, great no. deal. So we've had uh, an infantry battalion go to Rwanda and go to Somalia. Yeah. Um, and that was about it. Um, there was no, um, you know, and even then you probably had maybe 100 guys out of each battalion, maybe a few more that actually had medals. And there was no um, Australian Defence Medal back then, which you now get after your four years. So it was really rare to see someone in their ceremony uniforms with medals. Had been deployed. It was just that quiet between the Vietnam Yeah, War. and there wasn't – like I remember um, after your training, you know, you would go to do uh, – like after your, ba your basic training and that, you'd go to do some extra training and they wouldn't have ammunition like blank rounds because the budget didn't allow for it. Yeah. So you'd literally like pew, pew, playing. <laughs> but yeah, so um, there was, wasn't uh, – you know, the army was probably about half the size that it is now and it just didn't have the funding like it yeah. it did. Um, it does now. So, um, but you didn't care. So you left after three or so years? Yeah, I busted my back um, uh, doing some training and um, it was poorly diagnosed um, and it took a long time to heal. And so I was um, medically downgraded um, and then I was on um, leave without pay uh, trying to find out what's next because it's uh, all you wanted to do is be a soldier and you finally got there and looks like you can't continue to be a soldier. Um, and then uh, my uh, one of my uncles said, mate, the clearance divers don't carry packs, which essentially yeah. was my only um, military uh, um, restriction. So I uh, yeah, went from the Army and joined the Royal Australian Navy. Right, so switch... Left, you completely yep. leave the army and then apply and go back into uh, basic training with the Navy. Yeah, yeah. HMA Cerberus recruit school, then did um, seamanship school, um, and then the School of Forest of Sea Survival, firefighting, and you know, basically your qualification course to post into a warship. Yeah. And then um, went up to HMAS Penguin to. Start ship divers and yeah, and that's uh, that's pretty hardcore stuff. They're very uh, hard, fit looking uh, blokes, the clearance divers, yeah, and the, the type of work that what are you, what are you training for? Um, so their roles obviously, uh, underwater uh, mine detection, uh, bomb disposal, searches, uh, underwater battle damage repair, so welding and fixing warships. Um, so it's it, it's I think it's about seven core skill set, yeah. Um, and it's massive. And like, for example, in the American Navy, you know, you would have heard of the SEALs. Well, you know, they're dedicated to just one stream that a clearance diver does. And then they've got their deep sea divers. And, you know, you think they've got these different trades where an Australian and a clearance diver has to be a master of all of them. Because you never know what's what job's going to come up from day to day. Like um, when I was in the Navy, guys from clearance diving team one uh, responded to the HMS Nottingham, which ran aground on... 
um, a Norfolk Island. Yep. So they had to go up and patch it so it didn't sink and it could get back to Sydney Harbour. Then the next day they're doing mine countermeasure exercises down in Jervis Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was that was fairly physical and intense. So that was all you that, do is train. That was uh, that was rocking your boat. You were enjoying it. Loved it. Yeah. yeah. It was. Uh, and you with um, it's and again it's like when I was uh, a recruit school in the army. You with like minded uh, people. You know, various backgrounds and ages and whatever. But you're all there for the common purpose. Yeah. And uh, it becomes you know an infectious brotherhood. Um, and you have bad days and you're gonna cry your fast off and. You know, they laugh and go, you're a dickhead, and, and, the, and then they help. But it's the same way how they – that's how they're also picking you up. Yeah. You know, if, um, it's that gentle ribbing that's also that camaraderie. And, you know, um, during the uh, – you, you know, you do night swims across Sydney Harbour and you're linked up and you'll start going, what's going on here? And, you know, the guy's fallen asleep because he's, you know, been running 20Ks and hasn't had much and sleep. I, I should point out, just because you're in the Navy doesn't mean you can't get attacked by sharks either. No, uh, one, one of your guys did get Paul, attacked. Didn't yeah, he? I yeah. was. Uh, I remember that morning because there'd been a lot of um, sightings around Sydney and at that time. And, yeah. yeah, and we don't. We actually had a family barbecue on the Sunday, and some of the relatives were asking me, my uncle, about have you seen sharks? And you know, and I dived at you know hundreds and hundreds of hours in Sydney Harbour by day and night at that stage, yeah. and I'm like, not, oh, I haven't, but the, you know, they're there. Yeah, um, and then yeah, two days later, Paul got. Hit at HMAS Cuttable, yeah. perfect storm. You know, um, as the sun's coming up, he's sitting on the surface in a black wetsuit, and you know. But if, if you look at how they responded to that, again, that shows you that brotherhood. You know, they got him out of the water, they treated him, tourniquet, you know, so, uh, uh, stopped the flow of blood, got him straight here in an ambulance, and up and saved his life. Yeah, you know, prof- professional. And I, I think people, I, I know with uh, police divers, people assume diving are. Uh, diving on the barrier reef and all that. But I've seen them go into some shitholes, literally, yep. and, and feeling around with their hands in the dark or a dirty creek or late at night, and uh, it's, a, it's a tough gig. When um, some of my instructors on my ship's divers course and that had served in East Timor in the, with clear, the clearance diving teams, yeah. and um, after the initial intervet stuff, because they were the first in there, they had to clear the harbour for the Navy to land on um, yeah. On docks and some, you know, one of the uh, jobs that the clearance divers do is beach surveys. So if you think of saving Private Ryan when the boats come up onto the beach, well, prior to that, the divers are in there looking for any obstacles to make sure they can do yeah. that. And um, uh, one of the uh, clearance divers, um, JJ, he got a commanda- a gallantry medal because, uh, the, especially back then, the CDs had I think it was 200 meters from the sh- from the shoreline in. And he was out of the water when a militia group in a truck came down on the beach, and uh, oh, yeah, you know, and he's been. yeah he's had to take cover and, and record all that, and um, then get back in and exfil and say, well, this is what's going on, and this is the threat picture from on the beach, because especially back then, this is before the technology we have now with satellites yep. and imagery and all that. So that was one of their main, you know, the SAS were the eyes and ears in the jungle, and the divers were the eyes and ears underwater. And, the and um, but. One of the roles after that was they were working for the UN war crimes and they had to dive into sewer pits and, yeah. and pipes pulling out body parts and dead bodies. Yeah. And at Day one of your CD course, you go to an autopsy. Yeah. I, I And quite often, well, they feel without gloves on, like feeling the bottom of the river. These, these are your yeah, eyes. Your, your, your fing- fingers. And uh, I, I'd just be hearing the soundtrack to Jaws or uh, or putting my hand down. The so when you start, you do your ship divers, it's down at uh, Balmoral Beach, HMS Penguin, and there's a, a jack stay, which is essentially a big rope across the beach. And as you're swimming along, the drop-off at Balmoral is just there, and you're like, oh, no wonder the sharks here. And you know there's... <laughs> Sharks coming in and out of of, of the spit, yeah, and yet, and you see a shadow, and, and noise travels faster underwater, and then um, one of the weekends during the dive course, they caught a bull shark, and they hung it up on the wharf, <laughs> and so in the morning we've come down for PT, and the instructor's got to be grinning his face. He's got the paper, the picture of the shark hanging is, oh yeah, that's right there, and they caught it in there, in the water, go, <laughs> so. Um, that's, it's interesting times. Yeah. So that, uh, well, how long did you stay in there? What? When did you leave the? So um, I was in a um, because of uh, when you dive, when you go up and down in pressure, oxygen expands and yeah. stuff. So you got to do a lot of medicals for sinuses and you know, dental yeah, for teeth of. and stuff. So I was in one of those medicals, and 
I looked across at my med docs and I, I noticed that my restrictions had weren't on there. Mm-hmm. So I said to the doc, hey, doc, is that accurate? And uh, she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, my poems, my, is that right? She goes, yeah. And I went, oh, okay. So I went out, booked in to see another doctor. I forget the excuse I gave. But again, to check, am I... You know, is that, am I right? So I, yeah. I could do a parachute course. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. Oh, service transfer straight back to the <laughs> army. Yeah. And then went up as an army dive instructor um, for that to take effect. And I applied to become a load master. So in- I don't think they can come after you now. But so it's basically uh, what was on your medical records, you noticed that it wasn't there about your, your back. Yep. And then that's part of the reason you left the army, joined the Navy, and then you've looked. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. and um, it was fun, and, and everyone knew. Like yeah. I was not, uh, not, not a grey high. sailor yeah. in any way, and um, yeah, it, it was, it was, yeah, everyone knew. So when it happened, it wasn't like it was a shock or, um, no, yeah. Okay, so you've gone back in the army. What year are we looking at then? That was two thousand three. Okay, were you deployed at all in no. the army at that stage? No. So when I missed deployments, right, and that's which killed me. And sometimes it's just luck of the draw with that. Who, yeah. What unit you're with and who who's getting uh, deployed? Very or, much so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I we'd obviously been in East Timor in '99, um, yeah. um, which you know if, uh, I'm not sure if your listeners remember, but that was essentially John Howard deploying the whole Australian Army yeah. into East Timor to um, to stabilise the country because they had had uh, referendums to break off from Indonesia. And the Indonesians started kidnapping people and really trying to um, influence the election for them to win it. And that didn't happen. And then they started massacring through their militias. And, you know, all power to John Howard for saying enough's enough, right? Respond and, quickly. Yeah, and, and it happened pretty yeah. quick. And um, I had a lot of mates uh, in the parachute battalion, for example, and they got paraded in Darwin and their original mission was to parachute into uh, Dili Airport, secure the airfield. Yeah. Um, and John Howard essentially gave him a, a, a pre-D-Day um, speech, you know, like that it's going to be casualties, it's going to be good, yeah. you know, a hard conflict kind of, I've um, got the faith in your training. Um, they got issued extra more body bags. Um, but the, the Indonesians and the militia just, no, we're not interested in this. So yeah. they never had to do that in the end. But- right. For years, I would used to um, get into conversations and argue with people that saying, to me, and there's no difference to what those guys were thinking, feeling, and prepared to do to the guys that landed at Gallipoli or Normandy. It's just that they, the opposition, weren't interested in the fight. Yeah, but you know, everyone, you, you put you, when you put yourself in that position, you put yourself there that you're going. If the fight's on, you're in it. Yeah, when and they were chomping at the bit too yeah. because you know. I wasn't alone with why I joined. Everyone, especially back then, everyone joined. And I, I just want to expand on that because I think people would hear hear us talk and go, "Ah, oh, you you're a, you love war or whatever." But you un- understand that if you're trained to be a soldier and people are being deployed, you feel like you're not being part of it, not because you want the the war, but this is what you're trained for, and you're not doing your job. It's like training for a football team and not being put on the park. And that's the best. And that's actually the analogy I would have just used. Yeah, hundred percent. It's um, you want to test yourself, but more important, you want to go through that with your te- with your team. Yeah, because the biggest thing that happens at recruit school and what makes um, the military the military and where soldiers struggle getting out of the military is um, when you're a civilian or you're a very me centric. It's all about me, whether it's known or unknown bias, but it's all about me. Yeah. What they have to their main objective at recruit school is getting you to be we, to think we-centric, the team, you know. Um, and that's what they're, especially in the first few weeks when people find it tough, that's what they're doing. They're getting you to think, you know, it's collective punishment. If you miss a timing, it's just not you doing 20 push-ups. It's everyone. So you go, my actions affect the team. And they're trying to, you know, by the time you leave recruit school, you're very we-centric. And then they build on that with your core skills for your job. But that just, you know, um, they're always mat- pitting you against. So I was in 22 platoon. We would go to the range with our company, so 22, 23, 21 platoon. And, you know, we're, we, we're better shots than you. So, But then within 22 platoon, you've got four sections. 
and we're the you know we're the best section. We got a better scores, and that builds that esprit de corps and that teamwork. Yeah. Um, so when you want to put it on the line, can we function at the highest level? And you, you know you you want to go there with your brothers because, um, and again, it's a an overused cliche, but it's hundred percent true. You want to not let the man down. Yeah. Next year, it's not about you anymore. It's about him and the team. It, it, it makes sense, and the way you explain it is very, uh, very clear. And uh, I think people would understand that that uh, you're part of a team, and you, you, if that team is in action, you want to be in action with that team. Yeah, there used to be an expression. It was called Jack going Jack on your mates. You yeah. know, and um, it, it was the worst insight you could get. If they go, mate, you're going Jack. It basically means you're not thinking of the team, you're thinking of yourself. So, and that could be as simple as um, you're out in the field and you've got a Mars bar. And you got to eat it, and mate, you're going Jack. Why? Where's your ten Mars bars? Where's one for everyone? Or yeah. break it apart? And that sounds really trivial, but if you let that fester, it, it builds and builds and builds. And the army actually outlawed that saying. You know, it was a chargeable offensive if you were calling someone. Oh, really? Jack. Yeah, yeah, because it was the ultimate insult. You know, you yeah. were putting yourself above or outside the team. It's almost uh, look, the, the equivalent to being called a coward. Or huh, yeah, whatever. well, yeah, probably worse. Yeah, because. In some ways, you can understand why someone might not, um, you know, risk yep, death. Yep. But um, so, for example, in the infantry section, if you're going out on a, you know, two or three day patrol, the first thing I'll do is I'll get all the ammunition and claymores and sixty sixes and radio gear and put it in the middle and divide that up amongst the section. And then, if there's any room left, your socks, you know, your stuff and. You've got to carry it all, so yeah, yeah, because it's the team. The collective comes first. Yeah, it's interesting. So you're in the army to two thousand and three. Um, so we've gone army, navy, back to the yep. army, and then uh, you left in two thousand and three and started private contracting. Two thousand and four. Two thousand and four was it? Uh, yeah, officially two thousand and four. Okay, tell us uh, your motivation there and, and what that was about. Um, so I was actually. Um, at a barbecue on a Saturday afternoon, and I bumped into a, an old mate um, that I had been in the army with, and he, he goes, "Oh, yeah, I'm going away uh, for some for work next week." And I said, "Oh, what are you doing?" He goes, "Oh, I'm actually going to Iraq on a training contract." And I went, "Oh, how'd you get that?" And he goes, "Oh, I've done a bit of work with him in the past. You know, he did a security contract in Vanuatu." And I went, "Oh, mate, that would be awesome." He goes, "They're still looking for guys." And yeah. I went, really? And he goes, yep. Yeah. He goes, have you got a passport? And I go, yep. Yeah. He goes, mate, give this guy a call uh, tomorrow. So I did that, called a guy named Wayne Banks, um, and then I was on a flight on the Thursday <laughs> right. so into that, Jordan. That, that quick. Yeah. That quick. Well, and what was your role? So um, we were initially uh, training the newly formed um, Iraqi police commando Brigade. Who were your employee? Who, who was your so, employee? So uh, we were s contracted to an Australian company called BLP. Yeah. Who were a subcontract to um, a US company that had the whole contract, so logistics and, you know, because the contract was also arming the Iraqi police, clothing and food. And, and um, and then they were on a DOD contract, so the right. US Department of Defense. So that was a training yep. initially. Yeah. Uh, but you are in a, a conflict zone or war zone yeah, at that so, stage? Yeah, we were at a place called Anumania, which was 90 k south of Baghdad. Um, it, it In the um, Iran-Iraq war was one of the biggest Iraqi army bases because yeah. it's only about 35 kilometers from Iran. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it got smashed in the second night of the first Gulf War and had been pretty much left desolate. Um, so they re-established it in March 04 as um, an Iraqi police training center. Um, and because the reason they did that is Saddam and his uh, most of his Republican Guard and his supporters were all Sunni, yeah. uh, Ba'athists. And so now they wanted to turn a lot of those. And if you remember, they they did the debathification policy where uh, the US ambassador just anyone who was a bathist got sacked and couldn't hold a position in Baghdad. Right. So they then had to raise all those positions out of Shia. So by uh, having this base in Shia area, it was easy for recruitment. And you know, I remember um, on the first intake. We had we're supposed to have nine hundred recruits. We had like six thousand people turn up. 
Yeah. And like we just had a list in Arabic. Who the leases who were they are no documents like oh, it was. It would, have been, it would have been chaotic. It was chaos. And you, like, if you were deployed with the Australian Army, you would have the the backing of the Australian Army. If, yep. uh, yeah, shit hit the fan. There, you're you're pretty much on and your nothing. own. Yeah, we yep. had we literally, and at that time there was uh, some US contractors that had the um, contract for the perimeter security. Yeah. But that the perimeter security was actually done by Afghans and, uh, I mean, sorry, Iraqis and Kurds. You had um, some other contractors building, re-establishing the base, uh, sewer and whatever. And then you had about 500 Iraqis. And that just slowly built up um, as they built the base up because it became – um, essentially four bases in a base where we were became the premier training facility for the Iraqi, I think it became the Special Police Armoured Brigade, um, and then three other uh, Iraqi army training bases. Did you, but, but were you in the green zone, like no. a safe zone? So you're outside the- Yeah, so even when I first got to Iraq, I uh, flew into Biop, so Baghdad International Airport, and- um, the company that I worked with had a, a house in the red zone in um, Mathana, which is an old Sunni neighborhood. It was actually right next to the interim um, Iraqi Prime Minister's compound, and right. it was opposite the old zoo. So we would go onto the roof at night, uh, have to put a strobe up because there were seal snipers <laughs> next door, and would literally watch um, the American Apaches getting a, a firing at insurgents in the uh, zoo at night. So when, when you're talking the war zone, this is not a sanitised uh, area, you're, you're in the thick of it. At this point, Baghdad was the most dangerous place on earth and there was no law. It was literally the Wild West. There was yeah. no Iraqi army. There was no Iraqi police. So it was just a free fall on the streets. The uh, sectarian violence hadn't started yet, so that kept – some of the violence down at that point. The Iraq, the American military had started to pull back because they were just about to change from the Coalition Provisional Authority, which is military command, across to an essentially an interim Iraqi government. Uh, that was in the process. Hadn't happened yet, but that was in the process. So um, it was the Wild West. Yep. So your day-to-day actions, it's the training – Trying to stay yeah, alive. Yeah, so well, so at Newman, yeah, get up at about um, I don't know between five and six. Do some personal training. Then we'd have our students from because uh, they would have to. And I didn't know anything about Islam or Arabic at that yeah. stage, so um, they would obviously wait, pray, break, pray, have their breakfast, and that. Then we'd get them about nine o'clock. And I was a, a firearms instructor, so I'd just teach weapons lessons, have lunch, teach weapons lessons till about four or five. And then, um, you know, it doesn't get dark until nine. We'd just go to the armory and get a thousand, two thousand rounds of ammo, and we'd all go down the range and shoot ourselves. Keeping your skills up. Oh, it was uh, my shooting went um, through the roof just because it, it, we were doing it every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, how long did that uh, contract last? Um, so we had no life support where we were. So. Um, and the Americans contractors at the base, they were short on staff. And there was a closest US uh, FOB, so forward operating base, was about an hour away on the uh, main highway between Q8 and Baghdad called Route Tampa. So we did a deal with um, – they would do convoys, but it was they were few and far between because they couldn't get enough guys – um, off sentry points to fill because you know you need three trucks and guns and stuff. Yeah. So so we go well we'll make a deal we'll supply you with three or four shooters if you know that, but that means that we can go and then we could buy stuff and you know, even just chocolates or soft drinks or whatever. And just breaking down this environment because I think you're talking like it, you're obviously accustomed to the environment but okay you're in a convoy or you're protecting someone you're driving if there's a, Someone on the street, the kid on the street, or whatever, you've got some big decisions to make. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you really, there was no, um, especially for us, no pre deployment training of the threat environment, what the threat environment looked like, um, what a legal or illegal target is. Um, so, not so much then, but definitely later, like within six months when I changed uh, contracts, 
did that become a massive factor? But, you know, you'd be driving down the road um, and everyone in Southern Rake had a, had a rifle, had an AK. Yeah. So who's friend and who's foe? Um, are they spotter network? And, you know, then you, you've got to learn on the fly, but you've got to learn they use towels and other markers to indicate to the locals what's going to happen. So if you drive down a, a road and you've got to remember the atmospherics because as you're coming back, if that's changed, especially the number of people, it's a fair indicator that they're going to kick it off. And did you come across incidents yeah, over there yeah. at, and, regularly? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially at that time. And it was one of those incidents where I got recruited across to a new US government contract. Talk, talk us through that. What, yeah, so, the, the incident and then how, yeah. how the US... Um, so we were um, yeah in one of those... Um, uh, US convoys and we got what's called a rolling ambush. So basically a car comes up alongside windows down and they just start blatting away at you and then they try to drive off because the IED threat wasn't very high at that stage. So there were not many armoured cars and even a lot of guys would take their body armour off and throw it over the doors right. uh, for, and then for protection. So it was one of those. I was in the back seat and they're American cars so the steering was on the other side, but I was in the, the back seat, back right, and I my you're given arcs responsibility essentially. So mine was from out the window uh, around to the you know ninety degrees, and I saw the car come flying up, and then they've got the schmags on, and as soon as that, and I just you know contact right, and I'm out the window, and started go. yeah started shooting in that. Um, they peeled off, and then uh, the a crucive weapon on the top, which was a 50 cal, started kicking in. And anyway, so we got to where we were going. And um, by sheer fluke, one of the guys on the convoy that day was the um, overarching operations manager, Dan Smith. Comes up and he goes, Hey, uh, mate, you did all right there. And I went, oh, well, As in how you reacted yeah, to it. Yeah, that I, that I identified it early and then um, gave clear, you know, contact or uh, what we call fire control orders and then engaged. Uh, you know, because you didn't hesitate, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, that's my job. And then he's like, oh, do you want a job? And I'm right. like, doing what? He goes, that? And I'm like, yes. So that moved from private contracting and then- a, a, Still private contracting. But the US based. Yeah. yeah so, um, and this was coming into, and I didn't understand anything about US politics at the time, but then it's now one of my passions. Um, it was coming into the US president um, election of George Bush versus John Kerry. Yeah. And one of the things that George Bush, uh, his platforms, and he had to do it because Kerry done it. Well, John Kerry was going to take all US troops out of Iraq. So George Bush was, well, we're going to scale down because we're handing it over to the Iraqis. And that's why the transition from the coalition provisional authority uh, across to um, the interim Iraqi government was important for him too, because so he could be seen to be making progress. But People saw that he was reducing the U.S. troop numbers, but they weren't looking at the budgets. So he essentially raised a private army to fulfill election promises. Right. Um, so and that's where so money was coming from the U.S. government, but it was private yeah, companies. Yeah. So you had um the- you had um a year, and it, it was raw at that stage and became very fluid after. But um, the U.S. contracting office out of the embassy in Baghdad would. Uh, you know, it could be a core engineer building contract, but and they all had security components, or it could be straight out PSD. Um, you know, you would have heard a black hole, a black water, black water. You know, they were one a U.S. government contract to provide uh, personal security detachments for the U.S. embassy ambassador and stuff. So that's an example of another one. But companies would bid on the contracts, but at this stage there weren't that many companies, and it was hard to get shooters. Um, so. There was a lot of wheeling and dealing done in the contracting officer. So they'd go, okay, well, this company is already doing uh, one of those contracts at Fallujah or whatever. So they'd get the country manager in and go, do you have the ability to if we extend this contract or if we do this? And so they um, were in the process of um, extending their uh, contracts on the what's called the Coalition Military Assistant Training Teams. Yeah. And so every base that they had assistant training teams and the Australian Army at that stage had two teams in um, and the contract was to provide base perimeter security and then uh, 
QRF and um, threat detection for that base out to a 50-kilometer perimeter. So instead of having a U.S. Army unit there, they had a contractor do it. Um, and so because um, EADT had already had that contract at Numenea, they just got it rolled into, instead of the contract being a single location, the contract became the project. Right. So every time they added a location, EADT just got the location. So we wound up with Al Kasik, Numenea, Al Hila, Taji, uh, Baghdad Police Academy, uh, Camp Fallujah, I think I said that, I think one, one other. Now, you mentioned Fallujah. Um, at what stage? Because uh, uh, speaking to you before we did the yep. uh, podcast and when we caught up, that uh, you're in the second battle of Fallujah. Yeah, so that's, and this is how. So, um, the, there's the US Marine base outside of Fallujah, and then there's the Iraqi. Yep. We had the contract um, to provide base security and, prote- and threat protection for, for that camp. And then along with that, in that contract, we also had what became known as advisor sister company uh, responsibilities with those Iraqi units um, to because they weren't allowed into the American Camp Fallujah and they weren't allowed access to the classified uh, information and whatever. Yep. So we could get that and essentially lead them into their areas of responsibility during the battle. So with the, with the the second battle and uh, in research, it was described as the uh, U.S. Marines' biggest battle since the Vietnam War. Oh, it was Urban. massive. Uh, talk us through that because there's not many people that uh, you yeah, know actually have experienced that type of uh, conflict. Yeah. So the background is um, the. Fallujah Ramadi and that is in the Al Anbar province, which is Sunni heartland. Um, and so they were disgruntled from the moment Saddam got taken over because they were all his loyalists, you know, senior Ba'ath Party members and Republican Guard. Um, when the American um, conventional forces first went in there and um, offered protection, it was very passive because it was that the fog of war, the war's kind of over. Where are we next? Um, and That's then, because uh, the official narrative was that the Americans have moved out, but you guys are still left yeah. in there doing it virtually the work by proxy. Yeah, and and so this that hadn't really taken effect in Al Anbar yet um, because it was still it was the hotbed nut because that's they knew that's where a lot of Saddam's forces who down tools went, um, and so uh, they were having a lot of counterinsurgency, a lot of gun battles. Um, still at that time, where other parts like where I was down in Yemeni was pretty passive compared at that time compared to where to Fallujah and Ramadi, and that's also where the foreign fighters started coming in, which you, which um, you would be familiar with Zakawi, yeah, who was the who started and was the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq. So that's where his base was, and you know because he was Jordanian, and if you keep going along that road, that's where you wind up in Jordan, Saudi Arabia. So they would come into that highway and set up and train in Al Anbar and then fan out into Baghdad or whatever from there. So it was a very key facilitation and logistical route for you know what became Al Qaeda in Iraq. Then, uh, so um, the US Marines were getting ready to rip or rep- uh, replace, in, in replace in place the US Army Conventional Force. And they'd done their assessment of the battle space and they went, right, well, a lot of the issues they've got is the locals don't trust them. Um, because of, you know, gun battles and blah, blah, blah. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in and wear our US Marine uniforms and with a clean slate, we'll do a lot of key leadership and tribal engagement to say, look, that's happened in the past. We're starting a fresh relationship because in the Arabic culture, they're very much on um, oaths and promises. So uh, like I, I said to you, Gary, I, you know, I promise I'll be there tomorrow or whatever. And if I don't do it, it's just whatever. Yeah. In their culture, it's a blood oath. And um, the Americans didn't grasp that at first. So they've lost a lot of trust in, um, in the local tribes and sheikhs who hold the power in Al Anbar. And the Marines knew that. So they were going to come in, new uniforms, reset the relationship, have key leadership engagements, and hopefully pacify what essentially is a powder keg. But as that uh, um, rip was happening, you would have heard of the Blackwater incident where they ambushed the four guys and dragged their bodies through the streets and hung them up on the bridge. So, and then that changed everything, right? They was they set them up. 
Um, and you know, so all, these these were contractors. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Four Blackwater contractors that were providing security, which was ridiculous the way they did it. Um, of um, a couple of um, trucks that had refrigeration um, that were going to a base, you know, literally yeah. as big fridges, and um, they were ambushed. Yeah, killed going through the then. main main street of Fallujah, they got jammed in. You know, hand grenades under the cars. It was soft skin. Yeah. Yeah, and then they mutilated the bodies and hung them up on the, the bridges at Fallujah. So then that changed the American mindset. Right, well, if they want to do that, you don't get to do that to Americans. If they yeah. want to do that, well, then we're going to go in and, you know. And the initial intelligence reports out of Fallujah was, oh, it's not us, it's foreigners, um, which was partly true, to be honest. The foreign fighters coming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the cow and he's our cold in Iraq because he'd just done the car bombing at the Samara Mosque and he'd started his campaign. So- they go, yeah, but if it is a foreign fighters, we don't want to hurt the locals. So what we'll do is we'll do a letter drop and tell them, give them a few weeks. And to the north of Fallujah is a place called Haditha Dam. And they built uh, essentially a man camp for about 50,000 people, did this letter drop and said, on this date we're coming in, um, if you don't you know, move to the man camp, yeah. we'll pay, you know, you'll give you food, a medic and all that, but we'll get you out of Fallujah that way you're not hurt. So when we go in there... Only the enemy would be there, and it was a. In theory, that's that sounds great, because you've given them warning. You know, you're taking care of them. You're giving them somewhere to go. In fact, you know, it's going to be better medical and whatever. Uh, but no one left. Yeah, you know, they, and you've given them full warning. Yeah, and but but so they can prepare. Yeah, yeah, but but when I say no one left, like women and children of families, and yeah. you know, it's portrayed very accurately in um, the movie American Sniper, where. Chris Kyle's sitting there and there's the mum and the kid picking the, the mortar around and that up. Yeah. That's what it was like. Um, like and, using using the kids and all the kids are yeah. around the front line. Yeah. And, and you know- That they, makes for a hard environment. Oh, how, how do you, you know, um, prior to that, the war in Iraq, you know, the, the actual war, it was the Iraqi army. They had a uniform. They had designators. Yeah. You knew who you were killing. You were killing a soldier. All of a sudden, in, in uh, an urban environment, and you know, at the time they were talking about, oh, you know, last time we fought a counterinsurgency war was in Vietnam. Yeah. Well, the Viet Cong wore black pajamas, so they still um, wore a uniform that you could distinguish locals to them. You'd have no idea going down None. the streets there. Not one bit. No. Yeah. And that was that was a problem that they used to their advantage. Um, you know, later on, uh, you know, if you go into 2005 and beyond, there were two main roads from Baghdad to Fallujah, Route Mobile in Michigan. And they'd get young boys to dig the holes on the side of the road, but that they'd implant their IEDs in, or they'd get a young boy to sit on the middle of the road. So you've got a, you know, US Marine convoy coming down the road, you know, probably 19, 20 year old Marine driving the first Humvee. He sees this kid in the road, he's got two options. Now, he knows it's an ambush set up. He knows it's designed for him to stop. Mm. So there, if he does stop, he's going to get ambushed. Or he, if he runs a kid over. And he also knows that they they canalize the terrain, so they might have a burnout vehicle, um, some road spikes or some IEDs and stuff. So you know that you can't go if around- If you him. go around that kid. Yeah. You know, that they, they jam you into that, essentially that kill zone. But it's all initiated by running over a kid, which they're filming, and then they go straight to the BBC and other news or post it online. They were, back then, there were websites like Ogreish and that. US Army just drove over a, a boy. Shane, I, I, I think you've the way you've described it and the way you tell it and you've sort of brought us right into uh, that environment. Like, I defy anyone to, um, yeah. Work out how they're going to make these choices, these decisions. That, that's that's wars. One thing you know who the enemy is, but put in situations like that, no wonder people come back. Um, yeah, you know, changed. Well, I think the, the hardest thing, you know, and it went into Afghanistan too. You knew who the enemy was, yeah, but um, you just had to believe in yourself that a woman and a child can be the enemy. Yeah. You know, can be willing or willing participants or how willing are they? But there were other tactics that the, uh, especially our Qaeda in Iraq would do. They'd go into a compound and there'd be the, you know, mother, father and kids and they'd grab the father, go, right, you're going to drive a car bomb for us today and if you don't, we're going to kill your family. <laughs> yeah. And then they'd have the car bomb rigged up 
and he'd literally have his hands taped, taped to the steering wheel. Yeah. And it'd be remote controlled. So they'd be sitting back in a building watching the checkpoint. So they're going to detonate anyway. He's just got to drive the vehicle. And if he doesn't, they're going to, he knows they're at home and they're going to kill his kids. And so you'd see guys drive up and their eyes are like dish bowls. And you're like, and they would use a 105 millimeter artillery rounds. Yeah. So the car would be on an angle anyway. So that was one of the indicators. Car bomb, and they used to always use the same kind of taxis. I shouldn't laugh, but they were like yeah. key. You know that's boom. And there's vo- uh, videos that I've got that are that are also on um, YouTube. You know, if you typed in um, uh, Green Zone Checkpoint Twelve Car Bomb, you'll see one pulls up, comes out, drives into the car bomb, and detonates. Yeah, and that was a daily occurrence. You know, um, that checkpoint in particular was Checkpoint Twelve of the Green Zone. It got hit every morning at eight thirty for three weeks straight because that's when the locals were coming in to go to work and they kept hitting locals. I, I'm listening to you talk about it and, the, and I'm seeing that you, the you, we talked in the introduction, said you're you know a student of history, but your analytical mind too, like the way that you're thinking, you, you, you're thinking and you're strategizing on how this is occurring and uh, who to look out for. And I can see why you've been drawn to the world of in- yeah. intelligence. And like that's what it was. Because yeah. like some people might just go, ah, oh, look, it's just bloody like kid, whatever. You're really thinking about it, even the history of the uh, areas that you were uh, working in. Yeah, and it's funny. Um, I, I can almost pinpoint the 24-hour period where I was hooked on intelligence. And that yep. was um, – I was put in charge of a um, – PSD movement from the green zone to Taji of uh, an American um, uh, Department of State guy. And so it was the first time I actually went to uh, a higher level intelligence briefing. And so they're talking about the threat on, on this road and these areas and trends and, you know, a couple of graphs. And and then, you know, not knowing any of that stage, I said, oh, am I able to get a copy of that? And I said, yeah, no dramas, you know, and they emailed it to me and I'm going through it. And I go, and they just brought in a curfew. So no one could be out on the roads or after, uh, between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So I'm like, well, if you go from the Green Zone to Taji during the day, you know, you've got to go past this uh, marketplace, which is a massive choke point. There's a mosque up to your left, which you always get shot at in your car and turn fire because it's a mosque. And, you know, it's only about, 20 k's but on a good run during the day it's about two hours yeah and i'm looking at these the trends and graphs and that and i go well there's a curfew on now and there's no one on the road it'll take us about 20 minutes if we go at one o'clock in the morning and so i said to my um ops manager i said can we go like tonight and he goes what do you mean and i said well is there any rules when we have to go we've just got to get him there by nine in the morning or ten whenever it was ten in the morning he goes yeah I said, he goes, well, you know, you're the team leader for this one. Ask him. So his name is Vic Random, uh, Rick Vandermeer, and uh, he was actually an old agency guy, and this led into a lot of other stuff he wound up doing, um, swings and roundabouts. But So I, I rang him up and I said, hey, um, Rick at Shane, uh, I'm doing your movement uh, to uh, Camp Cook. Uh, do you have any issue if uh, we do it at night? He goes, Shane, if you're getting me there safe, I don't care when we do it. <laughs> Yeah, and I go sense. all right. Well, um, you come around um, whenever you want, you know. But and you can have dinner here, or um, you know, come around after dinner. I've got a room you can have a sleep. Pretty much, we we'll do that way. So he did. He came around, had dinner with us, and I said, "Go to sleep." I'm just literally just going to wake up and chuck you in a car. You know, you don't need to be on the brief. You already um, done our walk through for our action zone. If we have to cross deck and actions on, you know, down vehicle and all this stuff, and um, and. I didn't know his full background, but I knew he was an ex-agency guy that kind of knew yeah. the lay of the land. Um, and yeah, so you know, we got the cars ready and pretty much woke him up and chucked him in, actually laid him down the back seat of a. And we used low pro vehicles for this. Uh, oh no, we didn't. We used um, up armored F three fifty gun trucks, um, and the the limousine or the the client vehicle was uh, an encapsulated gun truck again, all sprayed tan, um, but no shooting ports. Um, and I literally want to put him in there with his body armor on. You might lie down, go to sleep if you want. Yeah. You know, we, he's like, oh, yeah, whatever. And 25 minutes, we were in Cancun, you know, and Got it. when I uh, opened the door up and he goes, Is, are we all right? Are we left? I said, mate, we're there. He's like, what? <laughs> and then uh, my driver, a guy named um, Steve, uh, he turns around and he goes, you know, fuck me, Ozzy. That was awesome. We haven't been doing that for fucking years. 
<laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, but but I, that was it. Boom. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Something simple like that. Yeah. Thinking strategically, thinking a little bit outside the square. And uh, and because, uh, you know, and again, we did the same thing the next night, yep. getting him back there, um, and everyone's high-fiving, and that was it. I, I was hooked, but I sold my ability and concept by how smooth that was. And, and then Rick goes, mate, that's what we're doing. And so we got his company's contracts and then he also put word in at the embassy to his um cohort uh, which is you know referred to as oga other government agencies yeah. um so then we started yeah doing a lot of work um with them and but and that's how but i that, got the bug that's, that's how you got the just the taste for literally it. looking at trends and yeah getting back to the uh second battle of fallujah yep. where you were did you get injured or in that battle? Uh, we had um, we lost uh, our team leader and his driver from an um, ambush from an RPG on the twelfth of October. Yeah, going out, uh, going out there. I'd been in that vehicle for the two previous days, and um, on the third day, we had an extra vehicle added to the convoy, so I was moved out of. Uh, the command vehicle and as the vehicle commander for the new gun truck. Yeah. And we've actually re, um, we were taking more stores and more contractors out to Camp Fallujah. Um, so, uh, and that's what was the third day. You know, we'd drive out there, dump guys and equipment off and whatever, come back and we're up to a third day. And um, anyway, we're driving along again near Abu Ghraib and I'm not sure if I, I've sent you the photo, but. Um, I just remember seeing a flash to the uh, right and then we were probably doing about 90 k's with a spread of about 150 metres between vehicles and their vehicle slowed down and um, I'm on the radio going, um, uh, Jackal, so that was Dave's call, so I'm Jackal, Jackal, this is Aussie, radio check, nothing. I'm like, uh, Jackal, no. And then uh, his driver, Aaron, I'm like, nothing. And I just got a sinking feeling. So I said to um, Matty, my driver, I said, mate, speed up. You know, yeah. something's wrong there, slowing down. And as we went up on the left, we looked in and there was a big hole in the front of the vehicle where the RPG went in. Right, straight through. Yeah, and it was a B6 vehicle. Um, so basically, and there's a, a where the road is on the berm, there's a big guardrail. We essentially had to nudge their vehicle into the guardrail to get it to stop. Yeah. And we didn't know how bad it was. All we could see at this stage was this hole and some smoke coming out. But you naturally think it was. So as we got out, within five seconds, I reckon, all hell broke loose. Yeah. Just, um, yeah, we we're getting smashed from the high right uh, with PKM and AK fire. The bullets flying everywhere. Yeah. So, and we actually had to use the their vehicle as a shield because that's where the rounds were coming from. And because um, of the heat and the impact of the RPG, it actually bent the chassis. So I'm not sure uh, if you listeners know, but with what makes a car bulletproof or B6 essentially becomes an egg. And so the percussion that pushes it together, and mm. that's what makes it um, non-penetrable. And the thickness may, will mean like a um, bulletproof windscreen is rated at B6 if it can stop the first four rounds of 7.62 by 3.9. Um, you know, definitely not going to stop an RPG, especially at that, that distance. Um, so, but we couldn't open the doors and we didn't, we're trying to, while we're getting uh, gunfire, we're trying to use a hooligan tool to get our door open. And then one of the guys, uh, Animal, who's a, um, a Delta Force guy, he went to jump up on the bonnet to look in and just, just got peppered. And then, you know, and I was like, and, you know, Animal was in Black Hawk Down, like, this guy, you yeah. want to talk about a warrior. This guy's a warrior. And I just look at him and he goes, fuck, man, we're going to, fuck, we're going to assault that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? And he goes, until we can shut them up, we can't do anything. Now, we'd already been on the radio uh, asking for QRF and there was a Marine QF, but we had our mates in there and we didn't know if they were dead or alive yeah. or whatever. So we assaulted um, this um, PKM position neutralized that, came back and um, how graphic or honest do you want me to be? But you can be honest if um, we'll go too far. Like, yeah, so we pretty I, much- I, I think with this, Shane, and I'm seeing here silent because you're giving a real first-hand account into what it's like in so, that yeah, environment. So again, 
I think it was Maddie looked in the window and you could just tell Weeks' expression. It wasn't good what he saw. Mm. He's just screaming, but fucking got to get in there. Um, so we put um, an M4 through the hole and started blasting a, a hole in the window to try to wrap a chain around the door. And the Marine QRF had turned up, so we actually used a Bradley fighting vehicle right. with a, a chain on the back of that and it pulled the door off and instantaneously the Terp um, no, no, the comms guy went running out of the back and to be able to tackle him um, and then we looked in and to Aaron and Dave uh, were deceased and uh, uh, Terp Ahmad, he looked but we found a pulse on him and actually resuscitated him and he lived. Right, okay. Um, and Rob, who was sitting where I had been sitting the previous two days, um, had percussion like his ears were blown and you know, a frag and that but because he was sitting on the right side behind Dave and the RPG came from the right, the percussion kind of went to more to Ahmad and that and missed him. But the overpressure and that yeah. is what, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was um, uh, very much a reality check. He heavy, heavy stuff, isn't it? And uh, you start questioning, um, like they were exceptionally um, religious guys. Like they pray before every mission and – um, you know, like the saddest thing for me, Dave, he was an amazing guy and he was the one who um, recruited me personally onto that team. Right. You know, and he'd only been back into theatre for about two weeks after. And, you know, he had at that stage four children under four. He had a four year old boy, two year old girl, and two twins that were nine months. Mm. And, um, yeah, you know, and Aaron, uh, he had a, a daughter and his brother was uh, um, serving US Green Beret that was in Iraq at the time, Shane. Um, and and I remember thinking like, I'm no angel or whatever and, you know, some of the other guys, but these guys- Were good people. Yeah, like why them? And, and you know, like why was I taken out of the car and, and then, you know, animals slapped me. He goes, mate, we're in a war here, mate. That's, no time that's for, for later. Thinking. Yeah, you know, and I'm like, fuck it, yeah, whatever. You know, we, we were literally, we had to go on to Fallujah. Yeah. And in, continue on with our role. So you, you don't get time to process it, um, uh, especially at that stage. And, and, you know, there was no mental health or anything like that. It was get on with it. And uh, Fallujah, quite nasty, you know, 24 hour mortars and rockets. And, um, and this elevates your sense of awareness and, um, one thing I did learn is that was I was calm uh, and clear thinking in that that chaos. Like you, I, you I, said, chaos became your norm. Yeah, yeah. But and I remember after that coming back into Baghdad in um, early December, and I caught up with a mate of mine, Trent, who was who was a mentor. Um, he was an ex intelligence corps officer. Uh, and he was the one who really mentored me in um, in my career and stuff and taught me at that time how to do intelligence. And I'd meet up with him in the mornings to go to briefings, but we're having a catch-up. Um, I think I must have got back that day, and we're having dinner. And in the green zone, there's a counter-battery balloon, and it'll pick up on radar when rockets are coming in. It goes, incoming, incoming, rrr, rrr, incoming, yeah. incoming. So you hear the counter-battery go off, and people start running uh, for their bunkers where they get their rolls and uh, one had impacted. I'm still sitting there reading. Just desensitised. Yeah, up. and then Trent goes, mate, you need a break. And I'm like, well, well, this was our 24-7, yeah. you know, where I've just come from. So you don't, you, It's changed you, but you don't realise you've changed. No, no, because again, and um, there's a very famous scene in uh, Band of Brothers where – uh, Lewis Spear, who was a real soldier, you know, goes, man, you you, you got to view you're dead already. Yeah. And, you know, otherwise, and, and that's where we were talking. You, you hear a lot of people say that going into uh, the combat. Yeah. And I, I can understand the, the thought process there. Well, uh, yeah, it's, and I've done a lot of work in to that, the mindsets in the last 12 months. And I, like, it, it astounds me when a police officer gets involved in a shooting and they're all, or even, you know, an assault in, from the public and you'll hear the police association come out and go, you know, eh, police shouldn't be punched. Well, actually, that's their role. Like, they're, they're, yeah. that's what a sheepdog is. You're putting yourself in between. It's like being a fireman and not expecting to fight a fire. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I 
I know where you're saying, what you're saying with that. I've always been, like with policing, you're not conscripted. I understand that it impacts on people differently, but if you if you sign up for homicide, you're going to see a dead body. Yeah, yeah. and I think it comes back to um, training. And, um, may, and and that's where we're talking about sheep, sheepdog and that. Um, making the training as realistic as possible so you operate in, you continue to operate in that environment. Yeah. And you can never, uh, you know, even though uh, in later, when I was back in the military and that, and you do triage and they'll chuck fake blood and, you know, you would have been to yeah. like a, a homicide courses when they set made, it, set it still up. not the same. No. You know, um, you know, or when you do training with simunitions or paintball, you know you're not going to die. Yeah. And when, when it's uh, alive, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. And, and processing that. So, um, but the... the Flip side for me was I found I was home. Like, I loved it. Yeah. Just, and it wasn't until, like, I was only went there for three months originally. Yeah. You know, August, September. I was coming back to go back in the army and go on my ladies' course. Yeah. And this was, you know, well, I got shot for the first time on the 23rd of December, 2004. Yeah. In an ambush, uh, two in the morning in South Baghdad. Um, and, um, you know, Where, where'd you get shot? Oh, uh, in in the my back plate. Oh, that was lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. an inch higher, and I was. You gone? Yeah, um, and that was um, we were um, when I said on the pro, uh, uh, contracts, we were responsible for threat security fifty meters around the base, and so they were hitting logistical convoys mm. um, in this between these certain villages, and so we were in there to work out who was doing it, and you know, basically get them out flush them out to find out where those positions were or whatever. So we hit this US Army checkpoint about two in the morning. And so this is winter too in Iraq, so it's freezing. Yeah. And there's this little US uh, National Guards and soldiers community goes, and he used to always spit them out because I was in a US uniform and I go, get up, man, how are you going? And they're like, the accent, what's going on here? And he goes, where are you going, sir? And I said, oh, you know, we're going down the road. He goes, oh, every time a truck or someone goes down that road, they get shot at. And I'm like, hey, do you hear that, boys? We're getting shot at, Danny. Yeah. And they're like, you know, we're getting excited because that's actually what we're trying to find. Yeah. And he's like, oh, what? And the other big thing that was happening at the time, which is one of the things we're trying to illuminate, was they were taking prisoners because it was the first time they started doing executions on um, the internet. Yeah. And so they were trying to get host Western hostages. So- um, half their intent wasn't to kill, was to Capture. Um, render the convoy um, useless and then come and get people. Yeah. So as we start, you know, we leave the checkpoint, lock, lock, you know, ready to go. We would have got maybe 300 metres on the road, pretty much exactly what we said. And I'll never forget because we're on NVGs and it was like Star Wars. It was just all this trace around come out of the right, like the, the grasses to the side of the road. And me and the driver literally scooched and he just go through the window and then through the back of the truck. And then I've come up out the window and started engaging. And so then what they would do, about 200 metres down on the left, they would start firing from that side. Because what would happen, and again, they, they watch the reactions. Everyone aims at that first contact point. So even the guys on the left or whatever, they're all orientating this way. Yeah. So when um, they start shooting at the left, no one's actually waiting for it. And so I got hit from around that came from the left through the vehicle and hit my uh, hit my plate. Okay. I've always, whenever I've uh, worn uh, the vest and uh, in tactical policing, I've always wondered what it felt like if you were hit with it. How, so, did, how did it feel? Uh, well, so I was lucky that I was lent over. So- it essentially ricocheted okay, off. Okay, so it wasn't a, a glance. No, yeah. yeah. But again, um, if it had been three inches to the left, it would have ricocheted into my head. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it goes back to that, you know, um, I firmly believe when it's your time, it's your time. Yeah, fatalistic. Uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, in, on the 7th of August 2007, a uh, 122-millimeter Katusha rocket hit my my bedroom. When I was in there, I was doing my shoelaces up to go to the gym. Yeah. Incoming, incoming, looked up, flash, lying on the floor. There's shit everywhere. There's a big hole where my wall used to be. And I'm like, oh, I'm dead. Like, I'm dead. This is, this is death, you know? And then I hear, fuck Shane, Aussie, 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 Shane. And I've gone. Stop. All the pieces are there. Stood up, walked out, 
And they're like, you're right, mate. And I went, well, they're talking to me. I'm not dead. Didn't have a scratch. Went to work that day. It's the whole back of the courtyard and that, like uh, the, where the rocket hit, was a, a, a half meter thick concrete um, barrier. Yeah. Then the side of the um, connex and um, some ballistic plating there, and what the rockets do, they blow out backwards all the engine and everything. So it, it wrecked armored vehicles and that behind. That I like, I hit the when it hit, it blew me. Um, up into the ceiling to the back wall and then on the floor. Well, you're a tough, tough looking guy, but I think there might have been a little bit of luck in, well, in there too. I yeah, just, right place or, right, or wrong place. I, but. I just think it's when it's your time. Yeah. Well, it's probably a, a, a way that you've, you've got to look at it. I think we'll uh, we'll wrap up uh, part one now. Uh, oh. I think people have got a real sense of, uh, yeah, this is, this is Shane uh, in war. This is Shane the, Shane the soldier. Now you're going to fight this evil a different way when we get back in part two, and we're going to talk about the work that you did as a um, uh, intelligence officer okay. and all the uh, all the stuff that you got involved in there. But what's coming across is that, um, and and I think this is good to hear it from someone like yourself that uh, there's so many things that go into when you look at the war zone and you just look at it. Just there's so it's such a complex environment in which you are operating there, and especially um, a counterinsurgency. Yeah, it's not. World War One trenches, you know, they've got their uniform there. And they've got their flag up and yep. you've got your flag and charge. Yep. It's none of that. That's no. a completely different uh, different environment. Yep. So, look, let's uh, let's take a break and we'll be back, uh, back shortly for part two and uh, cover off on all the intelligence work that you've done. Mm-hmm. 